for the Facebookers. I'm gonna make sure everything is well for the Facebookers. Okay. I want to see if the feed is working and I believe that it finally is so Marcus Garvey is born August the 17th of 1887 he can be considered the seal or the last of the great 19th century revolutionary pan-african nationalist he did not invent revolutionary pan-african nationalism marcus garvey reinvented revolutionary pan-african nationalism the founding fathers of this ideology of mine the founding fathers of this ideology of ours includes bishop henry mcneil turner who died today 102 years ago he died may 9th 19 15 Marcus Garvey shows up in America March 23rd of 1916. There's the Reverend Henry Highland Garnett Okay, there is Martin Delaney who is the originator of the Africa for the African slogan This is there is Edward Wilmont Blyden. There is Alexander Crummel who spent 20 years of his life Okay, fighting for African empowerment and independence in Liberia and a whole host of others. There is John Brown Russworm, also from Jamaica. John Brown Russworm, also from Jamaica, who has never been given the credit that he deserves as the first significant revolutionary pan-African nationalist. He's the first black man to get a college degree in America. He's the first black man to publish a newspaper. That's right. Freedom's Journal. Y'all remember that. Freedom's Journal was published by John Brown Russworm. But when we go to Jamaica, we don't see any tribute. I've never seen in a ton, many times I've been to Jamaica. I've never seen any tribute to Jamaican John Brown Russworm. So something needs to be done about that. In fact, I'm going to be working on an upcoming book, an upcoming book, a magnum opus on revolutionary pan-African nationalism that's going to go all the way from John Brown Russworm all the way down to Dr. John Henry Clark. I said we're going to go from John Brown Russworm all the way down to John Henry Clark. Okay? Now, first of all, when we talk about Garvey and Garveyism, we're talking about the highest stage of revolutionary pan African nationalism. When we talk about Garvey and Garveyism, we are talking about the highest stage, the highest stage of revolutionary pan African nationalism. So, Marcus Garvey travels throughout the Caribbean. He goes to Costa Rica. He goes to Port Limon, Boca Tel Rio. He goes all through the Caribbean, through Jamaica. And everywhere he went, he found African people being oppressed. Everywhere Marcus Garvey went, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, wherever he went, wherever he went, he found black people being exploited, used, and abused. Garvey said, I looked around and I said, where's the black man's king? Where's his queen? Where's his kingdom? Where's his army? Where is his men of big affairs? And he said, because I could not find them, I would help to make them. Because I could not find them, I would help to make them. He goes to England, to London, okay? He works with Deuce Muhammad Ali for a time on the African Times and Orient uh, Review, okay? Deuce Muhammad Ali. Okay, who was of Islamic leanings, who was not a revolutionary pan-African nationalist, but he employed Marcus Garvey. He was one of the writers in, in, in Deuce Muhammad Ali's paper. But I do want to clarify, because everyone wants to claim Garvey as a descendant of their movements. Deuce Muhammad Ali is not responsible for teaching Marcus Garvey nationalism. Marcus Garvey was a member of the National Club in Jamaica going back to 1909. Marcus Garvey was a member of the National Club in Jamaica going back to 1909, where he worked with Sandy Cox of the Jamaican National Club. Okay, he also he also worked with one of the greatest Jamaican pan-Africanists of all time, a brother by the name of Dr. Robert Love. 
Dr. Robert Love, who had relationships with many of the founding fathers of revolutionary Pan-African nationalism. So I want to make sure we click. Marcus Garvey was already writing for the Our Own newspaper in Jamaica. He was already a part of the National Club in Jamaica. Before he ever left Jamaica, Marcus Garvey was already a nationalist. Marcus Garvey was already firmly rooted in revolutionary Pan-African nationalism. And that's not to take nothing away from Deuce Muhammad Ali. I believe there may have been some bi-directional influence. I have tremendous respect for Deuce Muhammad Ali, tremendous respect for Noble Drew Ali, who was an associate of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. They agreed to disagree, but they, main, uh, they, re, they uh, remained with a cordial relationship towards one another. And that's an example that we all can take from the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey in, in Prophet Noble Drew Ali, the fact that they disagreed, they could still be friends, they could still be associates, okay? In fact, there's a very famous picture of Noble Drew Ali sitting in Marcus Garvey's escort car during one of the international conventions of the African peoples of the world held in Madison Square Garden, okay? Because that's where we get this. That that's where the red, black, and green comes from. That's where the red, black, and green comes from. That's where the red, the red, black, and green flag is the flag of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. And I would argue that it is the red, black, and green flag's continued preeminence amongst African people globally, which, which, it is the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey's flag, the red, black, and green, which is still so preeminent amongst African people today that I would argue clearly shows the Garvey influence in all of black nationalism in Pan-African nationalism throughout the world. There's only one flag that black people flock to. There's only one flag that black people flock to. We don't flop to that flag. We don't flop to that flag. We don't flop to their flag. We don't flock to that flag. We flock to this, the red, the black, and the green. This is the only flag that we flock to. And why did Garvey create the red, black, and green flag? Why did the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey give us the red, black, and green flag? And when I speak of Garvey, respectfully, I'm also speaking of, I'm also speaking of the 15 million revolutionary Pan-African nationalists who were members of the Garvey movement. So when I say Garvey, he didn't do it by himself. None of us does it alone. I have the National Independent Black Parent Association. I don't do it alone. I got 25 brothers and sisters representing 25 different chapters who are helping me do that. So when I say Garvey, I'm speaking of Garvey and all of those who worked with Garvey. But the reason, Mr. Garvey, the reason the Honorable Marcus Garvey gave us this flag is because at the time, at the beginning of the 20th century, you got to understand Garvey's setting. You got to look at we're talking 50 years out of slavery. 50 years out of slavery is when the Garvey movement hits us. 50 years out of slavery and you got a black man saying that we are the equals of everyone. You got a black man saying that we have a right to own our own land. We got a right to control our own destiny. We got a right to worship our own God. That was revolutionary 15 years after slavery. That was revolutionary. No one came to black people talking like that 15 years out of slavery. Nobody came to black people talking like that, but Garvey did. So you got to understand the time that Garvey came. The time that Garvey came is critical to understanding Garvey. Frederick Douglass just died in 1895. Frederick Douglass just died in 1895. Okay? So Garvey shows up 20 years after Douglass. Garvey shows up one year after Bishop Henry McNeil Turner has passed on. Harriet Tubman dies in 1913. Garvey starts the UNIA in Jamaica in 1914. So Garvey is the first, if you look at it, he is the first next generation leader. He's born in the 19th century and he's the seal of the great 19th century Pan-African nationalists. But he is the first significant leader 
coming from that period, closing out the 19th century, coming into the 20th century. So the reason he gave us this flag is because at the time, in America, during the time of Garvey, you had the St. Louis riots, you had the Red Summer of 1919 and other years, you had the Ku Klux Klan, you had the White Knights. This Dr. King isn't even born yet. Malcolm X isn't even born yet. Mega Evers isn't even born yet. Huey P. Newton isn't even born yet. Fred Hampton isn't even born yet. Stokely Carmichael isn't even born yet. They're not even born yet. And so Garvey gives us the red, black, and green flag because there was a song. White folk had a song and the name of the song was Every Race Has a Flag Except the Coon. The name of the song was Every race has a flag except the coon. Every race has a flag except the coon. So they were making mockery of the fact that the entire African world had been colonized except for Ethiopia and Liberia. And we could argue that Liberia was still a colony, respectfully. 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 The entire, every Caribbean island colonized by white folks. Every Central and South American country colonized by white folks. Every African nation colonized by white folks except Ethiopia with the possibility of Liberia. So they were making fun at the fact that the black man had no land. He had no king. He had no kingdom. So at the first international convention of the African peoples of the world, which is one, which is the largest international gathering of African grassroots Pan-Africanists in history. Facts. Marcus Garvey's first international convention, which lasted from the 1st of August to the last day of August of 1920, is still the largest comprehensive representation of Pan-African thought ideology and leadership in one place at one time. Now we're going to back up because we skipped over some things, but when you deal with the convention, which was held in Madison Square Garden, the Garvey Convention was held in Madison Square Garden, New York City. Now, there's been two Madison Square Gardens in New York City since. There's been two or three Madison Square Gardens in New York City since the days of Marcus Garvey. But at that time, it was unheard of. At that time, it was unheard of for a black man to organize an international convention and to have his call received and heeded from African people all across the world representing every land where African people lived. Remind again, brothers, you're talking about the 1920s. There is no King. There is no Malcolm. There is no Huey. This is the 1920s. And so could you imagine how dangerous it was back then? Could you imagine how dangerous it must have been in 1920? Because there was no airplane. There was no airplane. There was no airplane. Could you imagine how dangerous it was to be coming from a colonized Nigeria? Sneaking out of Nigeria in the middle of the night, getting on a ship. Floating on that ship. Floating on that ship for more than 30 days to come to New York City to participate in Marcus Garvey's convention coming from Ghana, colonized by the British, coming from Senegal, colonized by the French, coming from the Congo, colonized by the Belgians, sneaking into New York City to meet with Marcus Garvey, risking your life. They were risking their life to come to the first international convention of the African people of the world. Could you imagine how dangerous it was? 
Many of them had to come secretly. Many of them had to conceal their identity. But could you imagine how important Garvey must have been? Can you imagine how important Garvey must have been to the international African family for them to risk death? For them to risk death coming to New York, taking their last pennies, taking their last pennies, sneaking in from Australia, sneaking in from Cuba, sneaking in from Jamaica, sneaking in from Nigeria and Ghana, from all across the world, sneaking in with their pennies to come and meet with Mosiah. See, when you deal with this Garveyism, you dealing with something you ain't, you don't know about. And that's not taking nothing away from those who came after Garvey, who borrowed from Garvey, who studied Garvey. But what Garvey did was never done before. The only leader who never took a penny from another race. Garvey is the only leader of a mass movement to never take a penny from another race. He took no money from Arabs. He took no money from East Indians. He took no money from Europeans. Garvey. So let's go back. Garvey comes back to Jamaica after visiting his sister in England. He's on the ship. And while Garvey is on the ship, he reads Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. Marcus Messiah Garvey reads Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery. And while reading Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery, he gets so inspired by Booker T. He gets so inspired by Booker T. that he says, I need to start a racial organization. He said it was Booker T. Washington's Up From Slavery that motivated him to start the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. The Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. Now let me deal with that for a minute. Let me deal with the term Negro because a lot of anti-Garvey detractors, even though their organizations were started by former Garveyites, a lot of anti-Garvey detractors want to argue that Garvey called black people Negroes. First of all, and you wouldn't know this because you don't understand the science of Garvey or the history of Garvey, you need to know that Garvey did not want to use the word Negro. Marcus Garvey did not want to use the word Negro. Marcus Garvey wanted to use the word African. Marcus Messiah Garvey wanted to use the word African. But at that time, Africans in the Western Hemisphere did not identify as being African. They did not want to identify as being African. And so collectively, because the Garvey movement was a democracy, not a dictatorship. The Garvey movement was a democracy, not a dictatorship. The Garvey movement was a democracy, not a dictatorship. And so collectively, the UNIA decided that we're going to say Negro because that's the word that all African people identified with at the time. It was a pseudoscientific word. It is a pseudoscientific word that had been cast upon us that we identified with. We are not Negroes. We are an African people. But had Garvey not used the word Negro, blacks in America, it would have went right over their head. Garvey's movement would have went right over their head because we didn't identify as African. So they said we got to meet them where they are and take them to where they need to be. We have to meet them where they are and take them to where they need to be. It's no different today. It's no different today. Most of us identify as black. In America, we don't identify as African, we black. In Canada, we don't identify as African, we black. In the Caribbean, we don't identify as African, we black. So if you start an organization today and you say African, it's going to go over a lot of our people's heads because they're still asleep and unconscious. So all Garvey did was meet the people where they were. But that's why the name of the organization, the total name, is Universal Negro 
improvement. We want to improve upon the consciousness of the Negro. We want to improve upon the power of the Negro. We want to improve upon the economics of the Negro. We want to improve upon the culture. Universal Negro Improvement Association and that's not the whole word, the whole title. And African, African, African Communities League. Facts. Facts. It is U-N-I-A-A-C-L. Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. So he still, Garvey said, we still got to put African in the title because that's what we are. We know we got to meet our people where they at. They still consider themselves Negro. So we're going to say Universal Negro Improvement Association. But for those who know who they are, we have to speak the truth. So we're going to also add to the name of the organization, the African Communities League. Facts. Okay. And just to clarify, Garvey was not a religious figure. He may have been deified in the minds of people, but he never teached or taught that he was any kind of a prophet or a messiah. He never did that. Garvey never did that. The Garvey movement was not a religious institution. It is a nation building institution. The Garvey movement is about building a government. The Garvey movement is about building a government for African people. We believe in freedom of religion. Freedom of religion. As revolutionary pan-African nationalists, we believe in freedom of religion. And yes, we are African. The word African is a indigenous African word. Afrakan. It comes from Afruika, which means birth of man. The name Africa does not come from Leo Africanos. It don't come from no British. It don't come from no Spanish. It don't come from no Germans. The word Africa has two meanings. The first, it is a derivative of Afruika, which means birth of man. Afruika is one of the indigenous names of the continent from which our ancestors sprang. Afruika. And you can get this science from Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. You can get this science from Dr. Yusuf Ben Yakinen. You can get this science from Dr. John Henry Clark. You can get this science from John G. Jackson. You can get this science. Afruika, birth of man. And the second meaning is Africa coming from the comedic, coming from the comedic phonology, the ph comedic phonology, Afraka, Ra Ka. Ra is God. Ka is soul. Ra is God. Ka is soul. Ra is God. Ka is soul. So when you say af ra ka, when you say I am an af ra can, you are saying that I come from God's spirit. Facts. Get that anti-African bullshit out my face. Get that anti-African bullshit out my face. You don't want to be black? Good. It's a privilege to belong to this race. It's a privilege to belong to this government. It's a privilege to belong to this empire. All you Negroes running around talking about you ain't black and you ain't from Africa. Running away from yourself. Running away from yourself. And that's why we love Garvey. Because Garvey taught us to love who we were. Garvey didn't give us no new identity, no fake identity. He said, go back to where you come from. Reclaim your birthright, which is Mother Africa. Reclaim your birthright, which is Mother Africa. So Garvey, after reading Booker T. Washington, is motivated to start the Universal Negro Improvement Association and African Communities League. He lands back home in Jamaica, July the 15th, links up with Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife, who was a significant Pan-Africanist in her own right. You got to do your work on Amy Ashwood Garvey, who was present at the at the uh, at the fifth Pan-African Congress. She was present at the fifth Pan-African Congress. She was present at the fifth Pan-African Congress.
So you got Amy Ashwood, Marcus Garvey's first wife, and although they got a divorce, she continued to do work. Books have been written on Amy Ashwood Garvey, one of the queen mothers of revolutionary pan-African nationalism. So they get together, and Amy Ashwood was a powerful orator in her own right. They launched the UNIA a couple days later, but Garvey ran into opposition. Garvey was a deeply melanated African. That's another thing about Marcus Messiah Garvey. Marcus Garvey was not only the leader of the largest black organization of all time, Marcus Garvey was one of the darkest. He was the darkest major leader that you had in the 20th century. No, no, Marcus Garvey could not pass the brown paper bag test. Marcus Garvey was a dark, richly melanated African. And you don't get another major, deeply, richly melanated African until the late, great Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. I said the late, great Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. The late, great Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. And guess what? Marcus Garvey, the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, and we do want to put it in context because Dr. Khalid was working to be the next Garvey, but... He was nowhere near Garvey. No other leader came nowhere near Garvey out of respect, okay? No leader, nobody ever did what Garvey did. Garvey was an international African leader. He's the only leader we had who was simultaneously leader of African people wherever they lived at. No other leader can claim that. Garvey was the leader in South Africa. He was the leader in Nigeria. He was the leader in Cuba. He was the leader in Brazil. He was the leader in New York. He was the only international African leader. Okay? But Dr. Khalid was on his way. And the irony of Dr. Khalid and the Honorable Marcus Garvey being the only two richly melanated major leaders, the only two richly melanated major leaders of the 20th century, they both died at the age of 53. Facts. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey and Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad, our only two richly melanated, unapologetically African leaders, both died, or should I say were murdered. Both were murdered at the age of 53. Garvey died at the age of 53. Dr. Khalid Abdul Muhammad died at the age of 53. Okay? Okay, I'm talking about political leaders. I'm not talking about religious leaders. Okay. So, Garvey tries to organize in Jamaica, but he's not successful. Garvey's not successful because in the Caribbean, our slave master had so divided us against each other and put us in a hierarchy based on color. Based on color that in the Caribbean islands, you had octarone, quadrone, mulatto, you had about eight different color hierarchies. And as we are today, black people were not interested in being African. Black people were not interested in being black. They wanted to be light-skinned. They wanted to do what Serena Williams is doing. They wanted to do what our sister Serena Williams is doing right now, have a baby with a white man so your child can come out lighter than you killing the African DNA through miscegenation. They didn't want to be part of no Garvey movement. I don't want to be black. I'm trying to blend in with the whites. And so Garvey met all kinds of opposition in America. Garvey met all kinds of opposition in America. They, excuse me, in Jamaica, because he, they didn't want to be part of nothing like that. The hell are you trying to make me be African for? Africans don't get no respect. Africans don't get no jobs. Africans ain't liked. And that's why in the Caribbean today, you got skin bleaching problem. In the Caribbean today, you got skin bleaching. Brothers and sisters bleaching their damn skin. We got rappers bleaching their damn skin. Even right here in South Africa, bleaching their damn skin, trying to become white. So when Garvey stood up and said, up you mighty race, you can accomplish what you will, they ran away from Garvey. Who is you to come and tell me that I'm an African? We're not going to follow you. You as black as tar. We not following no blue, black, purple leader. 
You better go bleach your skin before you come talking to me. So the Jamaicans try to destroy Garvey because the culture was based on color worship and integration. Color worship and integration. They didn't want no parts of Garvey. So Garvey begins correspondence with Booker T. Washington. The Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey begins to communicate with Booker T. Booker T. Washington, who himself had an international conference for the Negro at Tuskegee. Facts. See, y'all criticize Booker T. I'm going to have to do a seminar on Booker T. Because y'all don't understand Booker T. Washington. Marcus Garvey's influence? Y'all don't understand Booker T. Washington? And who was Booker T. Washington's hero? Who was Booker T. Washington's hero? Who did Booker T. Washington write the first biography of? Who, were the, who was the great leader that Booker T. Washington wrote his, one of his first biographies? And that's the Honorable Frederick Douglass. Booker T. Washington idolized Frederick Douglass, wanted to be like Frederick Douglass, and wrote one of the first biographies for the Honorable Frederick Douglass. And so Booker T. comes from Frederick, and Garvey comes from Booker T., so Garvey also comes from Douglass. Facts. Facts. In fact, Marcus Garvey named his first black starline ship the what? The first black starline ship, 1919. Marcus Garvey, the first black star line ship was named what? The SS Frederick Douglass. The first black star liner, the first Garvey ship was the SS Frederick Douglass. So when I say Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey, know what I know. You got to know what I know before you open your mouth. I know my history. I know my history. FDMG, the first black star liner, was the SS Frederick Douglass, purchased for $165,000. Garvey. So Garvey writes to Booker T, and he tells Booker T that I want to open up a Tuskegee Institute in Jamaica. Booker T. Washington writes Marcus Garvey back and said, I will do whatever I can to help you build. Booker T. Washington tells Marcus Garvey, I will do whatever I can to help you build. So Garvey says, I'm coming to America to meet with Booker T. so he can help me build the Booker T. See, that's why I got to open FDMG, because Garvey wanted to open that up. Garvey, Douglas tried to open that up. I got to open it up. I got to open it up. So Garvey finally comes to America. He lands March 23rd, 1916, only to find out, only to find out that Booker T. Washington has died. Garvey shows up only to find out that Booker T. Washington has died. So he meets with Booker T. Washington's second in command, R. R. Moulton, the vice president at Tuskegee Institute in Normal School. R. R. Moulton. R. R. Moulton. Okay? And what did we find out later about R. R. Moulton? We found out later that R. R. Moulton was an undercover agent for the United States Army, brothers and sisters. Booker T. Washington's vice president at Tuskegee Institute, R. R. Moulton, was an undercover United States Army agent who was sent to Tuskegee Institute to infiltrate and spy on Booker T. Now, if Booker T. Washington was a sellout, if Booker T. Washington was the sellout that y'all claim he was, why did the United States Army send an army agent into Tuskegee, R.R. R. Moulton, to spy on Booker T.? Because Booker T. was financing African liberation. Booker T. was financing Black Wall Streets. Booker T. with the National Negro Business League. Booker T. with the International Convention of the Negro. And on top of that, see, we going in tonight. Ain't no whole tapping over here. This is notorious RBG, King Kong consciousness. You know how I ride. You know how I ride. You want the belt, you got to take it. You can't hate it away. If you want the title, you got to take it. You cannot hate it away. And see, when I study Garvey, and I'm nowhere near the level of a Garvey, brothers and sisters. I'm nowhere near the level of a Garvey. But when I look at what Mosiah had to go through, I see it on a smaller scale with my own struggles. 
Marcus Garvey's Black Star Line, that's the equivalent of Prince of Pan-Africanism's FDMG. Just like they tried to destroy Garvey's Black Star, you're trying to destroy the FDMG, but you can't. You can't. Because the foundation that I have laid, the ideological foundation of King Kong consciousness will survive long after I'm gone. I done already woke up millions. I done already woke up millions. Japan, you will see me on the 20th. Tokyo, Japan. The Africans, the reason I'm going to China, because you Negroes don't understand that this is a universal movement. That's why Garvey said Universal Negro Improvement Association. I'm going to Asia because there's Africans in Asia. There's the indigenous Africans who came from Africa and, and built civilizations in Asia, who created the ninja, created the samurai, created the Asian martial arts. We got Africans from America, United States military, who are stationed in Tokyo. They need to feel that energy. They need me to come and raise their spirit. They surrounded by Asians 